Cool. Thanks everybody for stopping by. <laughs> okay, there we go. Thanks everybody for stopping by. Um, I'm David, and I'm going to be talking today about what happens when AI makes mistakes. The alternative title was that time my AI assistant broke the code of conduct. And I want to share with you what happened there and then jump into how we can do natural language processing using machine learning and JavaScript. So just quickly about me, uh, I'm David Lücke. I have an umlaut in my last name, which makes a, for a lot of fun flying in North America, checking in on international flights. Um, I live here in Vancouver up on Main Street. I'll be more than happy to uh, point you to my favorite sushi restaurant or craft brewery. I moved to Canada about seven years ago uh, from Germany after I finished university. And back in university, I wrote uh, my final paper about a remote procedure call abstraction layer for different procedure call methods like SOAP. Uh, is anybody using it? SOAP? No. XML RPC, uh, Java remote method invocation, and REST, which was the most interesting one. Uh, that was written in Java, and shortly after that, Node came around, which was great, because I was able to take some of the things that I've done there and migrate them to Node and focusing on the REST API layer. And uh, a couple of great things happened. The first one was that uh, people started contributing to it, because it was open source. Uh, one of the, the greatest contributions was changing the name because you don't want to know what it was before. It's now called Feathers.js. And then the second one was that uh, some of the patterns turned really well into real time. And the last one was at one point somebody created an issue and said, hey, why can't we use this on the client? It works quite well on the server. And there actually was no reason. So. Now it works on the client and the server and creating this communication layer to build an API, choose whatever database you want, and then consume it on the client with whatever framework you want. Uh, I'm glad I was able to tell, <laughs> talk about that, but I'm totally not here to talk about feathers. Uh, I did bring stickers, so the first time I'm gonna be one of the first to get some feather stickers. Uh, like Matteo said yesterday, it's not a conference if you don't have stickers. Uh, I'm actually here today to talk about software that learns. And part of that are my slides. You can find them at nina.mysamai.com. And uh, they need a little bit of explanation. So uh, let's look at this. They're using a project I've been working on for a while called MySam, which lets us build language-driven uh, web apps, and if you use in Chrome or Android, you can actually talk to it by pressing the microphone button. Hey, can you hear us loud and clear? We'll find out in a little bit if this is true or not. The last time, it was lying. Um, now, before we start yelling at our computers, we can also use keyboard input and say something like, hi, my name is David, and I'll say, hi, David. You can also navigate through the slides just using the arrow keys. There is some interactive things on how to do language processing in there as well. The last time I did this was a little more than a year ago uh, in Iceland at the JSCon, which was a fantastic conference. And uh, it's going to happen again next year, and I highly recommend you go. And I brought a very elaborate uh, microphone setup from over here and uh, ask for a volunteer from the crowd to introduce himself to the system. And uh, Max Goodman, uh, who did a day before there, a great talk about the web Bluetooth API with lots of live demos that all worked fantastically, uh, volunteered and introduced himself with saying, hi, my name is Max. Unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. Hey, why don't you show us what happened the last time in Iceland? Let's, let's see if it works. So maybe start with your name. Um, I'm gonna press the button when it dings. It's like an answering machine when you start talking to it. Uh, let's see how this goes. Hello, my name is Max. Very 
embarrassing moments of my professional life. <laughs> it's okay. Nobody got hurt. Everybody understood that it was an accident. Um, now, before we talk a little bit about what happened there, uh, let's jump a little bit into natural language processing. And the first step is the HTML5 voice recognition API. Uh, it actually works quite well in Chrome and Android, as I found out today. Uh, but it does recognize even my funny accent. So part of this is, uh, I, I looked at it uh, in Firefox, it was said to be hidden behind a flag, but I didn't get it to work. So this unfortunately works only in Chrome and Android um, at the moment. But what I really wanted to get into is, let's say we have a chat input as well, is how do we take a sentence and get our web application to make sense of it? Well. We could use regular expressions. Uh, they do have, definitely have their uh, place in computer programming, but uh, like parsing HTML, uh, natural language is not the best place for regular expression. Hey, um, if we could get you talking to the uh, podium mic as well as your mic, it'd be really great just because. Uh, it happened it's, again. <laughs> it's not going to the room very well. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sorry. It happened again, but thanks so much for saying this. For sure. All right, uh, is this better? <laughs> all right, I thought I got it all figured out, but that's okay. We're good so far. Um, so we could, yeah, use regular expressions. Um, it's very tricky, very language specific. It sends a little bit different. It breaks. Uh, we could use a web service like Watson or API.ai or wit.ai, but then we would just learn how to use an API, a proprietary API. So what I wanted to go into a little bit more is uh, what happens under the hood. And part of that is machine learning. Uh, if I'm looking for a catchy title for my conference talk, uh, I will call it artificial intelligence. Now, Python is still the go-to language for this, but there's a lot of interesting things happening in JavaScript. Uh, one of them is uh, TensorFire, which runs your uh, models on the GPU through WebGL, which is really interesting. Uh, one of the more basic ones that has been around for a while is BrainJS, which is what we're going to be using here. Now, the secret with machine learning is to turn your input data into a list of numbers between 0 and 1. The list always has to have the same length. And then, in this case, because we're doing supervised machine learning, you put a label on it. This is, in, this is pretty straightforward for images, right? Uh, we take, turn our image into a list of numbers between 0 and 1, and then label it, this is a puppy, this is a cat. This is a nice example that I like doing as well for uh, BrainJS. It's um, training a neural network to recognize a color contrast. So given a color, does it work best with a light color as a contrast or a dark color? Uh, here we're training it with uh, red, which turns into the array of 100 zero, zero, uh, with a light contrast, yellow, which is 110 with a dark contrast, dark gray, with a light contrast, and then we run it against something that ha it hasn't seen before, uh, in this case, dark blue, and it says with 98% certainty that a light color would work best, which is correct. This actually might look, because it's actually running in the browser for you, a little different, because neural networks initialize themselves with random numbers to do the, before doing the training, so the results might be different, but it should be somewhere between 97 and 99%. Now the question is, we have our sentences, and let's say we want to label them with something like this is a positive statement or a negative statement. The question is, how do we turn those sentences into a list of number between, numbers between 0 and 1? There's a couple steps to it, and the first step is to tokenize. <laughs> like you see, uh, voice recognition doesn't always work perfectly, <laughs> but I like this one. 
Um, this is where regular expressions are perfect for us, so we'll just split our sentence into a list of tokens, individual words. Next, we're building the word stems. The word stems is the base form of a word. In this case, um, you'll see it removed the uh, ing and the plural form. In other languages that do more complex putting words together, uh, it's, uh, there's different stemming algorithms. Uh, so it's a little more important to get the base form of a word. Uh, a common thing to do in machine, uh, natural language processing and uh, search engines and things like that is to remove stop words. Stop words are uh, in, like commonly used words that don't really matter that much to what we're trying to classify. So the we and the the. Um, this is important for some classification algorithms. Uh, because we're using neural networks, they're pretty good at figuring out, based on noisy data, what to look for and what not. We can actually go with the full list of word stems. Uh, and I also had some trouble uh, training with something like, are you there? Uh, you see that it, it ends up with nothing without stop words, uh, which means it didn't do anything. And it uh, took me a while to figure out why. Now we come into the realm of multiple sentences. Uh, there's two true statements about me down there. Uh, the first one is that I like lasagna, and the second one is that I don't like Jira. Um, another true statement about me is that I love ice cream. Uh, if you also love ice cream, the best ice cream in Vancouver you can find at Ernest Ice Cream on Quebec Street is pretty delicious. Uh, so let's add this as well. And down there we have a list of combined tokens. What do we do? We take all those co tokens from our sentences, merge them all together, and remove the duplicates. So yeah, the I only ho shows up once, the like shows only up once, etc. Maybe you can see already where I'm going with that, because this combined token list is what is important in the next step, which is featureizing. So in this case, the list of numbers between zero and one that I talked about for neural network training earlier is called a feature. And what we do is we go through our list of combined tokens and through all our, and look if it exists in our sentence token list. So here uh, you can see that it, this is one, one, one with everything else being zero. Uh, and the one down here is the I is a one, everything is zero, and love ice cream is a one, one, one. This is actually what we wanted. We wanted an even length list of numbers between zero and one, which is great because now we can throw them into our neural network. Um, label them, so this one, those are interactive by the way, if you use them on your laptop, you can try it with different sentences and things. Uh, lasagna, definitely good. Jira, eh, not that good. Ice cream, also good. Now we train our network, and now we can classify a sentence against it, which that means we'll create the stems and go through the list and create a feature out of it. Uh, you see this is actually already a very happy neural network. Uh, it, it's 77% positive for an empty string, uh, probably because uh, of all the lasagna and ice cream. Uh, let's try it with, uh, I don't like pizza. And you see that that statement got classified as 84% negative and 15% good, which sounds about right. Uh, but that's actually a lie, I do like pizza. And now it turned into 82% positive and 17% negative. Um, which is nice, like this is a pretty good result for that we only have three training sets, right? Um, I'm talking a lot about food, I realize. Maybe I have to have lunch after this. All right. Uh, uh, there's a module for this. Uh, there's actually a great library called Natural Note that does all the natural language processing for uh, tokenization, stemming, and some different classification algorithms. 
And what I did is literally what I just talked about. This is way less impressive. You know what's going on under the hood is uh, using a, a natural no classifier to do exactly that. You add a sentence, you add a label, and then you run your classifier against it. Let's see if this works. But the good thing about this is that it also works in different languages. Like I said, we might have to adjust the stemming algorithm, but in reality, all those steps can be done for any language. So, since we're in Canada, let's try this in French. Any French speakers here? One? Okay, please don't be mad if I butcher it, or two? If I, don't, <laughs> if I butcher your language, but uh, there's a thing I remember from uh, uh, my French class, which is, uh, est-ce que tu parles allemand? Beautiful, now I'm more in my comfort zone. Uh, any Germans or Austrians here? Hello. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, ich glaube, wir machen aber trotzdem besser auf Englisch weiter. I got a Canadian touch. Cool. Um, so all this classification all also worked using uh, different languages, which is great. Now back on what I mentioned initially, uh, on top of that, I uh, built a project that's using Natural Brain uh, that I called my Sam, and I still don't, I don't have the perfect pitch, but I call it Trainable Natural Language Processing API and UI to create your own web-based digital assistant. And this is actually what you're seeing here. Uh, my slides are basically just a plugin for it. And uh, one of the fun things about it is that uh, you can train it. So if you say something that it doesn't know, like, hey, this is going okay today. I'll say, uh, okay, what, what do you want me to do? And then down here I can say, well, change the language, show the help. This is my slides. So this is how I got it to show certain slides. And we'll just say reply with, yay. And the next time this is gonna come up, it'll reply with yay. We can try that at the end. Now, this was a pretty fun project. Uh, and there was a couple of lessons that I learned. Uh, the one was that you don't always need giant data sets to build something useful. Uh, it was a lot of fun seeing that even with small data sets you can do something very interactive. Uh, the trick here, I think, was making sure that you collect new data as quickly as possible. And one of the things that happened was that initially I trained it with an action and then never told it if it was right. I only corrected it, which you can do here, when it was wrong. So eventually it got super confused and didn't know what I wanted anymore. So now every time you don't tell it that's wrong, it'll use that input if it wasn't entirely sure to confirm and uh, to confirm what it, the prediction that it's made to, and then retrain. So that was pretty cool. Um, also found that software that learns is uh, different. So as programmers, right, we're developing something and if it works, we're happy. If it doesn't, it probably breaks with a weird stack trace and we get frustrated. Uh, maybe it's the Germany me, the longer I've been doing this, uh, <laughs> the more frustrated I get when it doesn't work. Um, and, uh, well, I expect it to usually just work, but uh, with software that learns over time, it was really, really interesting to me to see that it can grow past something, features that you initially programmed, uh, much like training a, a, or teaching a, a human. And then going back to Iceland, the last thing is that it, it doesn't break, it makes mistakes. Now what happened there technically was uh, kind of simple. I, like I said, I brought a very elaborate microphone setup and didn't realize that one of the power adapters uh, doesn't run on 220 volts, so I had to get this converter, uh, which feedbacked into 
my entire microphone setup, and what ultimately came into the computer was pretty horrible in quality. Actually surprising that it recognized anything at all, but the result was not a weird error stack trace. It was this really strange occurrence that somebody pointed out in the uh, JSConf Slack was not really appropriate to the code of conduct because you know people, uh, as speakers, we, we shouldn't make inappropriate jokes, but uh, one of the organizers said, well, unfortunately the assistant didn't read the code of conduct. But to me it kind of showed that, well, software that learns is not really something like building it ethically or making sure that it makes the right decision. It's not something that we have to worry about far in the future, but it's like happening right now. And as you know, more things are making more software is making more decisions about and for us, uh, I think it's important to know, to at least have an idea of how it works under the hood and know what it, decide what it should and shouldn't do. And to me, two of those things that, that help were one, the learning part, uh, having the users interactively involved in the decision that, that it makes. Uh, it also makes it more fun to the users. And second, that it's about time that we start treating our, some of the training data at least, the same way uh, we treat our source code. Uh, because it's already been shown that some neural networks with, with transfer learning work a lot better if you take unrelated but similar training data, uh, they perform a lot better training with your domain specific data. So uh, looking at data, at least part of it, the same way as we do as code, uh, so that we yeah, can all build better software. And making it open, just like we do with open source, helps us all build smarter software yeah, together. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll be down there for questions. I'll be happy if you pick up some stickers. Thank you.